But I'd like for us to look at Matthew's Gospel, and we're going to look at chapter 1, and our foundational text will be with verse 18 through 25. That'll be our foundational text, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, starting with verse 18 through 25. Today we'll be looking at the earthly father of Jesus, and Joseph is his name, and we're going to be looking at what role he played in the life of our Savior. The birth of Jesus came about this way, and after his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And so her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant and will give birth to a son. And they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph got up from his sleep, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not know her intimately until she gave birth to a son. And he named him Jesus. Mary gets a lot of the spotlight we know when it comes to the birth of Jesus, but we need to understand that Joseph plays such an important role because what we will discover is that Joseph is a key example about what obedience should look like. A fun fact for you that you might not have ever considered, nowhere in the Bible is the words of Joseph ever quoted. Only his actions. And you know, the more I think about that, I consider this. Maybe actions are a whole lot more important than our words that are recorded. And so when Joseph's actions are recorded, it reveals the character of a man. How many of you have had people tell you one thing and they did something opposite? And so their character is revealed by their actions, by their works. People are looking at what we are doing as believers in Jesus Christ. And they say, if you really care, why aren't you doing something? We pray and say we wish you well. But what exactly are we doing? What we discover with Joseph and his obedience based on the scripture I just read to you in verse 18 and 19 we discover what the Bible calls, it says that when Jesus' birth came about, that his mother had been engaged to Joseph, and Joseph was not just some ordinary man, but Joseph was an upright man. You see, it's important to know is that Joseph had the character to respect Mary in such a way that he was not going to advance what we would consider his needs before they got married. Joseph respected Mary enough because he wanted to make sure that their marriage was a pure marriage. And he respects her enough because why? Because it is the nature of who he is. He was one who was upright in his doing. You see, it is important today when we learn about obedience that we also will be righteous men and women, upright in what we do. Joseph also, we learn in the verse that it says that he is one who is a considerate husband because even in engagement was still, the seriousness of it was just as if it were marriage. In verse 20 through 23, it lets us know that he considered everything and what was going to take place. Joseph was considerate because if you remember what he was going to do was that he was going 
to simply part ways privately. But the angel of the Lord came to him in a dream. And in coming to Joseph, we learn in verse 24 and 25 that Joseph listens to what is being told to him in this dream and he will be obedient to it. Can you imagine what this man is thinking? This young girl that he is engaged to that in so many ways is just as if it's a marriage, it's just not been consummated, that in this relationship they had, now she tells him that she's pregnant and it's God's son. That's not something normal that a man would hear then or even now. And so Joseph would have a lot of questions about this. He would have a lot of concerns about it because he knew that Mary, as we learned last week, was a very upright and righteous woman. He knew that he was upright in his actions. So how could this be? And before he brought public shame upon her, before and, and the husband could have allowed his wife to be stoned to death, to be put to death because of this, that he was willing to step back and do something privately so that it would spare her humiliation. But that's not what God wanted. God wanted Joseph to be in the life of his son, Jesus the Christ. You see, I think how important that is is because of all the men that could have been chosen, God chose Joseph because he wanted a man that would model what a husband and a father should be to the Son of God. Isn't I mean, just think of that. He chooses Joseph because Joseph could be trusted in modeling obedience. And we know that later on when Jesus enters into his earthly ministry, that's what he calls you and I to do as well. And here when the angel comes to him, he lets him know this. He says, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid. Because when he's telling him this in the dream, don't be afraid. It's just the idea that what is going on right now has probably got you on edge. Think about that. The embarrassment, humiliation, potential death. But he tells him, he says, don't be afraid. To do what? Take Mary as your wife. Meaning, don't be afraid to do the right thing. And sometimes we do get afraid, do we not, in doing what is right? But even in our fear, we need to realize that Jesus Christ, God himself, will give us peace. He will take away that sense of anxiety and replace it with his presence. And here we see that it says, don't be afraid to do this because... What has happened has been God's plan. This child was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So Joseph needed this from God, this angel, to tell him this. That doesn't make Joseph a, a, a bad guy. It just means that Joseph was just like anyone else. He needed assurance from God. And you know you have assurance from God. You might say, well, I've never had an angel show up. Well, you've had someone even greater than an angel. You've had the Son of God show up and tell you what you should also do in your obedience. Amen. In his obedience, you notice that he will do this. He tells him exactly what to do. He tells him also that he is to name him. Notice that the angel tells Joseph to do the naming. says, you will name him Jesus because it will fulfill what Isaiah the prophet said, that his name will be Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. And not only that was God going to be with his people, but God would be with this foster father. Think of that is that Joseph was chosen to be in the life of this little boy, this baby. Even though he was not his son, he was still to raise him as a son. Joseph, we find out later in Scripture, part of his character, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 13 through 22, it says that Joseph also was one that was a protector of his family. Look over at Matthew 2, 13 and just turn over just a little bit if you're still in Matthew 1. It says, after they were gone, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to Joseph in a dream. And he told Joseph to get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. 
For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Notice that God allows this angel to come again to Joseph because he trusted Joseph enough to do the right thing to do what? To protect his family. To protect the Redeemer of the world. Jesus was born to die, but not right then. He was destined to die on the cross. And so what happens is that the angel, when he comes to Joseph, he says, you need to get on up, you need to get out of here. And you need to go to Egypt, because there is one that will butcher all these babies in this time frame. Josephus, a Jewish historian, writes that this individual that it's talking about, Herod, that when Herod died himself to guarantee that people would mourn is that he had so many of the princesses and leaders of that area in Egypt uh, put to death, publicly killed, so that people would be guaranteed if they didn't cry over Herod, there would still be tears that would be shed because someone they knew and connected with had been killed. I mean, that's the kind of madman Herod is. And so where someone might say, well, this couldn't be, kill all these babies, well, fast forward or actually rewind back to Moses. We know that Satan's plan has always been to end the seed of David before it actually could take root and be the redeemer of the world. And if Satan could have allowed Joseph to be disobedient and stayed where he was and the baby Jesus be put to death then, then we would not be talking about the precious gift of Calvary's cross. We'd be talking about, well, I guess Jesus wasn't the Redeemer because He only fulfilled some of the prophecy. I want to tell you, friends, Jesus fulfills all prophecy that talks about who the Son of God would be. Amen. We next find Joseph as presented as a father that was concerned when his son got lost. You remember whenever they, Jesus was 12 years old, and the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2, if you read that account, it says that Jesus was 12 and that Joseph made it his responsibility to go up at every Passover. There was three times a year that they were required to go up to the temple. This was during Passover. And Joseph takes Mary and their other family, and they go up to the temple they spend time there during Passover, then they come back. It would have been like a large caravan of people. And if you remember, Jesus stayed behind. Well, they didn't know this for some time because Joseph and Mary thought Jesus was with some of the other people, you know, in the family. Then they discovered that Jesus wasn't there, so Joseph says, it's time to us go back and get our son. They go back, and if you remember, Jesus is in the temple teaching as one with authority. He's talking about his son. He's talking about when Joseph says, look at what his son's doing, the son of the Most High God is preaching about who he is and his father. Who is his father? God who is in heaven. And so you notice that at that point. Now it's interesting that Joseph kind of falls off the pages of history after this. Now, tradition... Tradition does not mean biblical. It just means tradition, okay? Tradition says that Joseph was an older man, and the reason why we don't hear anything else out of him after that is because Joseph died between the time Jesus was 12 and Jesus uh, was 30, you know, when he goes into his earthly ministry. I don't know. I do know this is that obviously Joseph showed enough love for his wife Mary throughout the time they were married and the time that Joseph was living that when Jesus was on the cross dying, he looks at John who would be a disciple of his and he said to him, take care of my mother. So obviously the daddy had instilled in his son the important role of taking care of a parental figure. Now I'm going to ask you men this. Are you, treat, are you treating your wife in such a way that when your son, if you have a son, when they get married, that's how you want them to treat their spouse? Are you doing that? Are you modeling what true, genuine love is? You see, the Bible tells us that Joseph was a carpenter. And when I went and looked up that word in the Greek, you know, a lot of times we think about one that's just working with wood. 
but actually he was would have been a mason uh, dealing with stone and wood. What were they building their ha- uh, homes with? It wasn't building their homes with two by fours. They were chiseling out the rocks, measuring it out, making sure everything was right there on the square. And so he does this. He's a, a master builder in this and that Joseph was one that didn't mind working with his hands. And so I can promise you that Jesus being one that he is, that Jesus would have been right there with his father in the carpenter shop watching his father, earthly father, chisel stone, build handles, do these things. And so Jesus understood the value of work demonstrated by his earthly father. Now all of this blows my mind and and the reason why I say it, it just blows me away is because you think about it. Joseph accepts Jesus as being the Son of God. He's really the first man to accept Him as the Son of God. And by doing so, we know He's bringing faith and hope and love and all of the things that God offers to us into His home by accepting what the angel told Him. Mary is the first woman who is accepting Jesus as the Son of God. She knew it. She had a first-hand experience. And Joseph does it based on the testimony of an angel. You see, angels do nothing more but they're messengers. That's the, the whole Bible, if you read it, they're a messenger. They don't come up with their own message. They're simply told and, and tell what they are told to say. The only angel that we find out that is not like that is in the spirit of rebellion, and it was Lucifer, this beautiful angel who does his own thing based on his own sinful nature of pride, And rebellion in heaven is cast out of heaven. But the angels that we talk about here are ones that are giving the message that God told about His Son, Jesus. Kay Arthur, one of the great missionaries, I stayed at her home in South Africa when I was there doing mission work. Kay Arthur says this, The will of God for your life is simple that you submit yourself to Him each and every day and say the following, Father, your will for today is mine. Your pleasure for today is mine. Your work for today is mine. I trust you to be God. You lead me today and I will follow you. I believe that Joseph could say those same words. Even though at the beginning he had a lot of confusion. But my friends, the more that he was obedient, the greater he was blessed. Let me give you a few areas in life in which we also can see this same obedience being a blessing. I'll give you three aspects of that, and then we'll wrap everything up. Obedience to God does one thing. It proves who we love. Are you obedient to the Lord? If you are, in 1 John chapter 5... You go and you turn. If you get Revelation, you've gone too far. But it's right there at Revelation, so that's why I tell you that. So if you go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 2 and 3, notice what it says. If you don't have it out, I'll give it to you. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah, did Joseph believe Jesus was the Messiah? Absolutely. He knew that based on what the message of the angel was. What was that? The message God sent. He says, everyone who believes that Jesus is Messiah has been born of God and everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of Him. Verse 2, this is how we know that we love God's children when we love God and obey His commands. Did Joseph obey the command of God? Absolutely, he did. Why did he do so? Because he loved God. He obeyed even in his questions, even in his, really, his doubts at times, what's happening. He still was obedient to accept this message. Secondly, we know that obedience demonstrates our faithfulness to God. 1 John, go back over now to 1 John chapter 2 and look at verse 3 through 6. This is how we are sure that we have come to know Him. By keeping His commandments. How do you know that you know the Lord this Christmas? 
You do what he says. It's just that simple. And then it says that the one who says, I have come to know him, yet does not keep his commands, is a liar. That's not me telling you that. That's the Bible telling you. So, boy, Pastor Ken, this is Christmas season. Why are you calling people liars? I'm just repeating what the Bible says. It says, if you say you love God, and, and yet you don't do what God says, then you're a liar. And it says, continue, and the truth is not in him. But whoever, you know you're the whoever. Whoever does what? Keeps his word truly in him. The love of God is perfected. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Don't you know that Joseph did this, even though this was written long after Joseph would have died, here this scripture was the idea of thinking about the maturity of the spiritual obedience of this earthly father, Jesus. He kept God's word. Joseph knew it had been prophesied by Isaiah and Micah and others. I mean, he had to be a very religious Jew, because why? He was going up regularly to the temple when he's supposed to. So he would have known about the prophecy, but now Joseph didn't quite get and understand that he was going to be part of that as well. What a shame it is, isn't it, whenever we overlook the role Joseph played in the Christmas story. He's very important, friends. Last, obedience does this. It opens up doors of blessing for us. In John 13, 17, it says, If you know these things and do them, you are blessed by doing them. If you know it and you do it, guess what? A door of blessing will open for you. If you're wondering right now, God, why are you not using me more and more things happening in my life than what it actually is, could it be that God says, I have given you the door of opportunity, but you cannot be blessed unless you actually go through the door. You can't do it. Some of us expect just to sit back, and it will just happen. It will not happen. Church growth does not happen by us sitting back and doing nothing. We must pray for God to move in a powerful way this Christmas season. But after you pray, you need to work based on what the Bible says. I love what one person told me years ago. They said, Kim, you need to pray as if God is the only one who can do it. You need to pray that way. But then you need to work as if God is only going to use you to do it. Make sense? And so you need to pray because what? Faith without works is dead. So what exactly are you doing? If Joseph simply would have listened to the angel and did nothing, then we would not have had the account of Jesus as we do today. He listened, he obeyed, and he was blessed by it. He accepted Jesus as truly the Son of God. He raised him in that aspect as well. When you don't know what to do, when we are faced with difficult decisions, or when we find it hard to persevere, we can look to the example of Joseph, the father of Jesus, who shows us that simple obedience will go a long way. Simply be obedient this Christmas to the Lord. And when we fall short, we can be sure that Christ's perfect obedience will carry us the rest of the distance. Because you will and I will fall short, but Christ will pick us up and carry us to the finish line. But we must be willing to be obedient. Can I give you one last thing, if you will? This is something that came to me. I was in Sunday school. And listening to our lesson about God's creation of man and woman and what the lesson was that Brother Carlton was teaching. And I broke down on my piece of paper, God had just really opened my mind and heart on this, that word obey. And I wrote this down 
and I haven't never seen it anywhere, so, so if you've ever seen it or heard it, then show me where it is, but I've never seen it. But I wrote it down because I felt God was putting this on me, and here's what I wrote. Obey, if you take each of the letters, here's what I feel like it reminds us to do. The O is open, the B is Bible, E is eagerly, and Y is yield. So let's put it together as a sentence. We should open the Bible eagerly and yield to it. Amen. That's what obeying is. How do I know what to do? Based on what the preacher says? Absolutely no. Because there are preachers that will lead people down the wrong path. How do I know what to do? Based on what my parents say? Absolutely no. That's not the only way. Because there are parents that do not have the best interests of their children, right? How do I know what to do? What society says? No. I know what to do because I've opened my Bible. Don't you know Joseph opened the scrolls and Joseph was going and looking and after the angel spoke to him in that dream, Joseph opened up what he had. We open our Bibles and when we open our Bibles, what do we do? We eagerly yield to God. What does it look like? It's a action. It is not being passive. And so I close out today and just ask you this. Are you eagerly yielding to God? If you're a parent, you know what it's like to get your child to do something. Force them to do it, right? They have no joy in it. Well, I will tell you this. When God looks at us and we do the work that He has called us to do as our Father who is in heaven, are we kicking our heels and making ugly faces? And we do it anyway. Now we do it. I don't want to go to Sunday school. I don't want to go to preaching. I don't want to give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. I don't want to do X, Y, and Z. We do it anyway, but we do it out of... Mm, I, I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it. Or do we simply open the Bible and when God speaks to us... Did you know God will speak to you if you're listening? And when we open the Bible and God speaks to us, much like whenever God spoke in a dream to Joseph through the angel, are we obedient? Now, I say this, can God still speak in dreams? Yes. But be very careful just because you had that pepperoni pizza last night and you have some wild dream, how do you base it the dream is from God? You base it on does it match the Word of God? So you get some wild dream and you come in here next Sunday and you say, well, I had a dream that you're the new pastor of the church and you get up here and start doing your thing. Well, that's not of God. There's order and decency in what God does as well. So can God speak to you in a dream? Yes. But I will tell you predominantly what God is speaking to you through is His Word in the Bible. Dreaming dreams, seeing visions. The Bible talks about that. Did you know that? Well, don't you sit there and wait for a dream. Don't you just take that Tylenol PM and wait for God to speak. Don't you sit there and take that NyQuil thinking, okay, I'll take that and God will speak. Or what is it? Some people, what, melatonin? Okay, y'all nodding your heads on that. I think some of you took it during Sunday school. Yeah, I love you folks, right? I'm teasing with you too. But don't just take that and think that God's just going to speak that way. He speaks through His Word. He spoke through Isaiah, spoke through Micah, He spoke through others in the Bible about what the role Joseph would have. And what does Joseph do? He's obedient and does it. As Tanya comes forward, the challenge is this. Are you open your Bibles and eagerly yielding, yielding to God? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to open your Bibles? Well, for some of you, you have to dust them off. But you know what? That, today's a great day to dust your Bible off and get into it. The Christmas story can be boring to some people because it says, well, I've heard it a million times. But you ever thought about the important role that Joseph played in the life of Jesus? Have you really just thought about the role that a man plays in the life of his son? You know, when a man is not in the life of his child, 
You know what happens? It, the child is different based on that absence. So God made sure to place Joseph in his son's life, in God's son's life, because why? Joseph would be there. Man, be there for your kids. Be there for your wife. Be like Joseph. Be obedient when God speaks. Let's pray. Father God, for any that possibly would like to join this church today, transfer their membership or join based on their act of salvation, they've accepted you and they plan to be baptized, I pray God that they'll make it known. For any Lord that are here today and they say, Pastor, I've opened my Bible but I don't eagerly yield to God. Lord, will you convict our hearts to yield to you? For those of us in here today that are saved and the Christmas season becomes so stressful, we get so giddy about going and get in the car and drive and see the lights, and we get so excited about what's coming from the North Pole, we get so excited about all the other stuff that at the end of the day doesn't mean anything. It's, it's basically garbage compared to the birth of Jesus Christ. Folks, just think of that. All that we do in our own nature is garbage, is filthy compared to if we do not focus on Jesus. Nothing wrong with gifts, nothing wrong with lights and wreaths and all those things, but I challenge you, dear friend, to be truthful to your children, to love your child. Maybe today you're in a, have an adopted child, maybe you're raising your grandchildren, maybe you're doing something that maybe you've, you've gotten remarried and there's another child from your, the person's previous marriage and you're raising that child, understand this, is that that child doesn't have to be your flesh and blood for you to be a good dad, a good father figure. And so I know this is not a Father's Day sermon, but it is a sermon about the important role of Joseph, an upright man, a considerate husband, obedient servant of God, a protector of his family, and a concerned father, one who's simply obedient. Let us be that way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.